Hi everybody, hope all is well. So today, um, good evening from Grenada. Um, I hope everyone is doing well. Thank you for coming in. I'm going to pray to start the service, then we'll go into worship. And afterwards, um, we'll listen to the sermon and then come back again for communion and then the last worship song. So I'm going to go ahead and pray now. All right. Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I thank you, Lord, for this new month. Thank you that we get to celebrate it together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your grace throughout the past months, the past few days. And I thank you that your grace still goes ahead of us. Even as we sit together to worship in your name, I pray that your presence will just envelop us and that you will show us how to grow deeper in you, just as the sermon is today. I pray for a word, a seed to, um, from the sermon, from the worship to just implant itself in us and grow. Heavenly Father, I just pray that your presence will fill our homes where we are. I know that we are not together, but your spirit is everywhere and your spirit is what unites us. And so Heavenly Father, I pray that in this moment that we're united in your spirit, whatever requests we have in our hearts, whatever um, prayers that we've put before you, whatever testimonies, whatever songs of thanksgiving, Heavenly Father, I raise them up before you. I thank you, we rejoice together and we comfort those who, we, who need comforting together. I pray Lord that it is well with us, it is well with this evening, it is well with our health, it is well with our protection. It is well with our going out and our coming. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you for this time. I thank you for this time of worship. Heavenly Father, as we go into the sermon, I just pray for your presence to guide us, to give us revelation of who you are, of how to approach you, of the confidence and the boldness that Jesus brought on the cross with his blood, that, so that we can come into your presence without fear, but to come before you as a child comes before their father. But I thank you for the relationship that you've always extended to us. Thank you for loving us first and showing us how to love you. Heavenly Father, I just pray that this confidence, the, that there'll be a lack of fear today as we hear about how to have a deeper relationship with you. I pray that whatever barrier, whatever stronghold, whatever things have set themselves up in our hearts that prevent us from reaching a deeper relationship with you, of knowing you more, of connecting with you more. I just break them right now in Jesus' name. I plead the blood of Jesus over those things. Anything that has stood in the gap between us and you, Father, I plead the blood of Jesus. And I thank you, Jesus, that your blood is stronger, your name is stronger than anything else in this world. And I thank you, Lord God, that you made a way so that we could come to the Father without fear. Uh, Heavenly Father, I thank you. For, uh, for the time going forward, that it is well in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so um, we're going to go into the sermon. But before we go into the sermon, I wanted to read out a scripture that I came across today in Deuteronomy. So I know when people think about Deuteronomy in the Bible, it's like uh, the book that has so many laws and customs. But as I've been over, I guess over the past few weeks with my family, we've been talking about how to have a, a deeper relationship with God. And a lot of it comes from, in the beginning, it's about knowing who God is, which is coincidentally what we've been talking about as CSA in the month of October. Unrelated, but, you know, God is speaking. So as we've been focusing on who God is and learning that God is with us, um, I realized that a lot of times when going into uh, thinking about relationship with God, there's that small fear of not knowing who he is or knowing how to approach him or knowing why he does the things he does. And the Bible does say that he will reveal more of his mysteries to us, but 
in the meantime, there's a lot of things he's already revealed to us. Primary example of it, like, or the most important thing he's revealed is his love for us, which is personified in the fact that Jesus came and died for us. Now, another aspect of it is looking in the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And what they have in common is there were, you know, there were some laws here and there, not here and there, there were laws, there were customs, traditions, things that when we when we look at them, it's, it's like, I can't, I don't know how I can stand up to it, the standard that God has. And in the New Testament, with Jesus coming, we hear of grace and how God has given us his grace. And when Jesus left his Holy Spirit so that we could obey um, and walk in in a manner that was worthy of how God has of how God has called us to walk. Now, in the Old Testament, even though we don't hear much talk of grace, we, I came across, and this is so early in the Bible, in Deuteronomy chapter six, verses twenty through twenty-five. I came across it, and I realized that that mention of grace has always been from the start, and that the idea that god wants us to know who he is and why he does the things he does and for whom he does the things he does it has always been from the beginning and so even if the old testament had many accounts that seemed um i guess that seemed far away from this idea of a merciful god they were all cohesive so i'm just going to read from deuteronomy 6 is this is from deuteronomy 6 I just stumbled over my words. Um, and what I found fascinating today, because it helped me, it helped me see the law and see um, just in general the, the, the first five books, because after Genesis, looking at numbers, Exodus, etc., it's like, huh, there's a lot to take in. But it helped me see that even if those books um, had so many what seemed like restrictions they were in fact just another way for God to show us who he was how he did the things he did so that we could come to him and not be afraid because we were coming from a place that we didn't know we were coming now from a place where we knew what he was like and I don't know about you but that is something that makes friendship or a relationship or diving deeper with God or anybody really in our lives, even better. When you know how to act around a person, you don't feel as awkward. This is how I feel, so I don't know about you guys. So Deuteronomy 6, um, verses from verse 20, and he says, when your son asks you in time to come, saying, what do the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments mean, which the Lord our God commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out from Egypt with a mighty hand. Moreover, the Lord showed great and distressing signs and wonders before our eyes against Egypt, Pharaoh, and all his household. He brought us out from there in order to bring us in to give us the land which he had sworn to our fathers. So the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always and for our survival as it is today. It will be righteousness for us if we are careful to observe all these commandments before the Lord our God, just as he commanded. So we see in verse 20, there's a question, why do we have all these things placed before us? Why should we know these testimonies, these statutes, these judgments, precepts, how God does the way he, how God does his things? In verse 21 is a reminder that God took them out of a place a barren place, a place where they hadn't been able to grow, a place where they had felt beaten down, a place where they felt it and had been beaten down, a place where they, they didn't want to go back to, but because of fear of the unknown in the future, they felt that that was a better place for them, a place that enslaved them. But God took them out of there and he didn't just take them out like, oh, let's just walk through the back door. He said, he took them out with a mighty hand. And in verse 22, he did signs and wonders. So he went in there and showed them that the God who was taking them out was capable of keeping them. And then in verse 24, why did God give us then these precepts after he's taken us out of this land? He said, 
for our good always and for our survival. I know that we talk about the Lord protecting us and keeping us. You know, I would, in Psalm 23, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And well, as you're walking through the valley, though, in the beginning it says, the Lord is my shepherd. The shepherd leads and guides. He has a way, you know, he's going to guide his sheep. And if you don't follow that way, that's where there will be an issue. But, um, but the shepherd leads and guides because he knows what is best for his sheep. And I hope that we can also see that, that from the beginning, God has always been this way to guide us for our good always and to keep us, to protect us. And if we're worried and concerning, well, the things, some things I can't keep, some things I'm not, you know, as always having obedience in, you know, before us. What has he told me to do? Am I doing it? But it says in Hebrews that Abraham believed in God and was counted unto him as righteousness. And this is why Jesus came, so that what we, our nature previously, before ascribing to the gift of Jesus, that was unrighteousness. Jesus came and took that on the cross so that we could have his righteousness. So as we believe in that gift, we now have that righteousness. All right, so that was my long introduction to, and I guess it was just what I, I wanted to share with you guys. And then into our sermon is talking about diving deeper into relationship with God. So it's by one of our past PSA presidents. I didn't get to meet her, but the sermon is for you guys and i hope you guys enjoy it and take as much out of it as i was able to okay so so this morning i was actually asked as i was leading it so are you gonna lay down on the floor again no not not doing that this sunday um and for those who don't know me i am and most of you guys know that I always start with a story, um, just because the most profound thing is what Jesus has done in my life. So this one's probably not super profound, but how many here know how to swim? How many here do not know how to swim? Like, people invite you to the beach and you're like, I'm good. <laughs> and they're like, no, 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 stay, stay by the board. And you're like, I'm good. <laughs> um, so, uh, my mom doesn't know how to swim, and she had an uncle who died, um, who was an avid swimmer, he was like in the Navy, and he was snorkeling and he died, so she put me in swimming classes, which is wonderful, but you have to understand that as a child, I've had the same character, um, which meant I could take a shot from the doctor, but when it came to like, submission, like practice, like dance recitals, I wailed all the time. Um, and I remember they put me in these swimming classes and guys, this is confession time. <laughs> I would hold on to the banister of that YMCA pool, legs crossed, screaming. The rest of the kids are already, like this is guppy style, right? We just have to go to the deep end. And I'm screaming. My mom would say that the poor instructor would have like scratch marks from just pulling as a no, no, no. Um, and this like leads to another part of my life. So I know how to swim. I didn't make it to very good or anything out there because they wanted me to somersault, and I don't even somersault on land, so I wasn't doing it underwater. Um, and I remember going to my first mission trip to DR, and at the end they kind of took us out to the beach. And we had these lifeboats and my friends decided like, let's go kayaking to like this little aisle. And I was like, guys, I'm good. Honestly, I don't need to kayak. But they thought that it was because I didn't know how to swim. Because my dad, and I love him, he's gonna see this later, I love you dad. He had told them that I don't know how to swim out of overprotection. And he was like, you know, I don't want her to drown. I knew how to swim. So I remember we got to the dock and I took off my life vest and I go to jump, and everybody's like, no, 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 no. And I was like, what? And they're like, uh, uh, put on your life vest. And I'm like, no, if I put on my life vest, I can't go down, I can't open my eyes, I can't see underneath. And they're like, yeah, but you don't know how to swim. And I was like, who told you I didn't know how to swim? I have the dramatic YMCA memories. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, your dad. And I was like, no, it is. Cool. I was like, actually, I didn't know how to swim, 
and I just jumped right in and joined like everybody else. So there's something beautiful about knowing how to swim and just the ocean. And if you've ever gotten to that point where you've actually dived under or you've snorkeled, there's this whole entire world underneath there. And you're like, wow, I didn't see this from the shore. I didn't see this from above. I didn't see this from where it was, where the waves were crashing, but now there's like little fishes. Has anybody gone to Grand Anson? They're like, there's little fishes. And there's like coral and there's a whole world. Um, and I remember, as a bio major taking invertebrate zoology, um, <laughs> him emphasizing the fact that the Earth's surface is covered in literally 71%, but like only 96.5, well, 96.5 of it's from the ocean, but then 95% of it is undiscovered. Like there are canyons bigger than the Grand Canyon, and there are mountains higher than the ones we're used to, all underneath. And there are creatures that have yet to be seen by man's eye. So I want you guys to imagine this. There is a world that we have not seen lying right in front of us. And yet people have a difficulty believing in heaven. <laughs> we don't know what's in the ocean, but it's there, undiscovered, unexplored. So, today I'm going to be talking from Ezekiel 47, 1 through 11. And background story. Ezekiel was this Old Testament prophet who not only did he see visions and see what God was doing, but it was very keen. God showed him what he was going to do. Ezekiel was always one step ahead. He was the one with the dry bones. Always one step ahead. Um, and today we're going to be talking about diving in deeper into the living water. So if we start from verse 1, um, the man brought me back to the entrance of the temple, and I saw water coming out under the threshold of the temple towards the east. The water was coming down from under the south side of the temple, south of the altar. He then brought me out through the north gate and led me around the outside to the outer gate, facing the east and the water was trickling from the south side. As a man went eastward with measuring line in his hand, and this is where my visual aid comes in hand. Adina, can you help me? So, let me start with the fact that, which a bit of definition. So a cubit is known in the Old Testament to be very basically from your hand to your elbow, roughly 18 inches unless you're short. So, as the man went eastward with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits, which is roughly like a thousand five hundred feet. Right? Let's just assume that's that. <laughs> then he led me to water that was only ankle deep. The man measured another thousand cubits and led me through water that was now knee deep. Then he measured another thousand cubits. Oh, we're going to end. And it was only waist deep. He measured off another thousand. But now it was a river that I could not cross because the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in a river that could not cross, that no one could cross. He asked, Son of man, do you see this? So let me explain what's happening here. We have water coming from the temple, which we knew at that time was where the Israelites would go, and the presence of God was there because he was in the holies of holies. And we see that Ezekiel is saying there is a river coming on all sides of this. And as I'm following it, it's getting deeper. Now, this is not profound. Everybody knows <laughs> that a river starts off small, and as you progress further, it gets deeper. But let's keep on reading. It says, 
Then it led me back to the bank of the river. When I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. He said to me, this water flows towards the eastern region and goes down into Ara, where there enters the Dead Sea. When it empties into the sea, the salty water there becomes fresh. Swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. There will be large number of fishes because this water this water flows there and makes the salt water fresh. So wherever the river flows, everything will live. Fishermen will stand along the shores from Ed Gedi to Ed Gala. There will be places for spreading nets. The fish will be of many a kind, like the fish of the Mediterranean Sea. So like I said, the river, not profound, but when we get to the next verse, we see that not only can this river not be crossed, but at its end, at its bank, everything is living. There are trees growing, there are fish of plenty, and it's turning salt water into fresh water. Now, this is all talking, and this is echoed in Revelations, but today we're going to be talking about diving in deeper. And how when we first started with our walk with Christ, we were ankle deep. You remember that? And we were like, oh, <laughs> this is new. What do I do about this Jesus? But we were ankle deep. And our problems were probably ankle deep. And it was, it was easy trusting because we could walk right through it. Ankle deep water, you can walk. And then we go a little further, and we got knee deep. And, you know, we're feeling a little bit of the resistance, but you can still walk through it. We're like, oh, that's my first, my first test, my first trial. Uh, we got this, Jesus. I can could, I could still see my feet. Then we get to waist deep. And now we're feeling the tension and the pull of the current. Has anybody gotten there where you, you walked, and then you're like, oh, I slipped. And you're like, okay, let me not drown, let me not drown. But now we're feeling this tension, this push, this river that wants to take us wherever it wants us to go. And now we're looking at our feet and we're like, I can't see where I'm going. There could be anything here. But then there's a deep end. Where walking is not good enough. Where seeing the ground where you are isn't good enough. You don't get to enjoy the nice, like, oh, let me pick up stuff and you don't get to do it yourself but now you actually have to swim or you drown <laughs> it's it's obvious there that when he gets there he says it's deep enough to swim how many are at that point in your life where god's taking them deep enough that you can't just walk it that you can't just like Feel the push and be like, it's okay, we're going to get through it. <laughs> we're going to get there. No, but now you see that it's too, it's obvious that it's too deep for you to cross. And now you have to swim. And that's kind of brings us to an interesting situation because all up to this point, there's a level of comfort with feeling the ground. There's a level of comfort was just walking through. You don't need to trust that God's going to get you there. You don't have to trust that this is not going to overtake you, that your problems aren't going to overwhelm you, that you're going to drown in ankle deep water. Nobody drowns in ankle deep water, hopefully. <laughs> no, hopefully nobody drowns at that. But now this requires effort. And the faith we had before is not going to cover it. Now there's an endurance that all of a sudden we require. Michael Phelps didn't swim all those laps just from waking up one day and going to a pool. It was a repetition. But if you're like most people who enjoy the ocean or water or swimming, at some point you've swallowed water and it's not been good. And what do you quickly do? You're just the shallow. You're like, you're like, 
and let me hold on to the ledge. Let me get somewhere. Let me find my feet again. Getting the salt water out of your face. And how many times in our Christian walk do we swallow a little bit of water? And so we quickly retreat to need to, because this is comfortable. This is comfortable. I know needy. I know what God requires me needy. I know what I have to do in needy. I don't have to change my lifestyle in needy. Needy is easy. I can do needy. But what happens when God's calling us deeper? What happens when God is leading us to a point that we have to leave our comfort and we have to start swimming. Where our faith is tested not by sight, but in him alone. So the first step is there is this vulnerability. You have to trust that the water is not over, gonna overtake you. You have to trust that he's not gonna let you drown. You have to trust him with your life. And that's a little bright. Because we're, we're micromanagers, especially all of y'all here with me included. Like, we got here because we're like, <laughs> like every little detail. <laughs> And we, we left a point where we're like, okay, I'm gonna wake up, I'm gonna do this, then that, um, I'm gonna make sure, like, you have, how many of you guys have that? Like, you have your life down to a T, <laughs> leaving no space, no space for curveballs, no space. And so, one of the frightening things about jumping into the deep end with God is that you're not in control. It's where the current takes you. It's where he's taking you. Um, I forgot who I messaged this to, but it's this idea that there can only be one hero to your story, and that's Jesus. You can't be your own hero. You can't... Has anybody seen that where somebody tries to save themselves from drowning? It's impossible. That's why we have that cards. <laughs> you, you save yourself from drowning. So there has to be this vulnerability of, Lord, I need to trust you. Here you go. My planning, my safety net, my floaties. <laughs> I'm taking them off and I'm giving it all to you. Teach me how to swim. I'm surrendering. But like I said, we all like the shallows. Because in the shallows, we can splashy, splashy. We can floaty right on. We, we don't have to worry. We have our crutches. We have our comfort to hold on to. We don't need to experience God's love fully because we're just good here. Why, why risk so much? So... If you know me, I love Bible verses. So, um, I want to show two things. John 37, John 7, 37 to 39. On the last day of the greatest day, great, greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood up and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the spirit whom those believe in him were later received. Up to that time, the spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. Then John 4, 10 to 14, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who is that is asking you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it? 
as did also the sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become like a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So we have these two things, and we realize that, now going back to Ezekiel, this river I've been talking about, that's Christ himself. He is that living water. And we have on two occasions where he explains, you will forever be thirsty. And I know that's a little difficult for you guys to understand. And this campus will forever be thirsty. How many know that's true? <laughs> this campus will forever be thirsty until we drink the living water. He is the only thing that can quench that thirst. The only thing. As we read in before, literally everything that was connected to that living water, to that river, grew. All the fishes, alive. If you looked at the swamps, if you looked at the marsh water, nothing. It was meant for salt, that's all. So, so what good is knee deep water, ankle deep water? Nothing, salt. But in a river, that's where life comes from. That's where sustenance comes from. Things can grow there. See, so you need to get to the deep end so that you can grow. Because you probably were wondering this entire time, like, why would I go to the deep end? It sounds so scary. Because that's true. And if you know that the moment you were a kid and you cannonballed into the deep end of the pool, that was life. <laughs> you were done with the shallows. You didn't care about Marco Polo. You didn't care about it. Now it's just cannonball, cannonball, dive, dive. Touch the bottom of the pool. The same thing with Jesus. The moment you dive in deep, there's no returning to the shallows. Because every time there's this exhilaration of jumping and then this comfort of something just covering you completely. Isn't that true? Don't you jump down and then you have that split second where you're like, I'm gonna drown, I'm gonna drown, I'm gonna drown. And they're like, oh, it's water, I'm floating, I'm floating, I'm floating. And you get to the top and you're like, I made it. <laughs> And that's the same thing with Jesus. It's this exhilarating jump of the unknown and then realizing that the Father is completely covering him. That's why we need the living water. Commitment. <laughs> I know some people have a love-hate relationship with this word. <laughs> But the truth is that the shallows allow you to have a certain level of intimacy and a certain level of commitment. If you knew somebody shallowly, you probably would just call them an acquaintance. You wouldn't call them a friend. And those who are in relationships, if you had a shallow relationship, like if you actually didn't know that person, you knew you would be like in big trouble. Like, <laughs> like how many know that when you start a relationship, you try to figure out like everything this person likes and everything they like to do, like you're trying to figure out their favorite flower, their favorite candy, what kind of genre of movies and music they like, because you want to know them intimately. How many know you can't be intimate with God in the shallows? Because he's deep. <laughs> he's deep, he's further. Your shallow faith, your shallow commitment is not gonna take you anywhere. He wants it all. He's waiting for you at the deep end. He's like, that's great, but when you get over there, I'm gonna show you who I am, and then I'm gonna show you who you are. Because how many know that's how relationships like actually happen? Like I've I've been dating my boyfriend for like a year and change, and like I didn't know things about myself until <laughs> I started dating him, and I was like, wow, there's a hint of my mom down there. <laughs> Who likes everything like, wow, look at that. <laughs> and it's the same thing with Jesus. You jump into the deep and you're like, wow, that's a new level of insecurity I didn't know 
I had buried in there. I didn't know till he revealed it to me in the deep. Wow, this is great. <laughs> um, let's be honest, how many, how many know exactly what I'm talking about? Like, you know, you, you thought you overcame fears till you jumped straight into the deep and Jesus was like, now let me show you fear. <laughs> that your fear was, you know, this thing. <laughs> you're like, I already overcame that, Jesus. And then he takes you further, and you're like, oh, that's the underlying issue. Cool, cool. All right. <laughs> How do we work on this one? <laughs> but that can only be at the D. That can only be by pushing through. Not being afraid of being overwhelmed and overtaken by the love and mercy of God. Because the crazy thing is, if you continue with the last story we read of the woman, we know that shortly after that, Jesus asked him, and this is how you know I'm speaking truth right now, when you get to the deep. Because she asked him, oh, what about your deep well? Like, you don't even have a bucket. Like, what are you going to do? And then right after that, he says, so are you married? That's how you know. <laughs> you get to the deep of Jesus. And he just, he just reveals something, not in a condemning way, but he's like, so, so your husband. And then quickly she was like, flustered, didn't know what to do. She just thought we were talking about water, now we're talking about marriage status, which is, and we find out that, that at the end of that, God reveals this to her, just so that she can later see salvation. And later he says, you know, Father, go, oh, your sins, you've been free. That's the beauty of the deep end. You're not going to get that in the shallow. You're not. So it goes back to verse 11. But the swamps and the marshes will not become fresh. They will be left for salt. Fruit, fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the rivers. Their leaves will not wither, nor will will their fruit fall. Every month they will bear fruit because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. How beautiful is that? It goes right back. Marsh water, ankle deep water, nothing. No good for God. Just salt. Just salt. Nothing will grow. But in the deep end, in the river, we can see that trees bear fruit and they don't fall. That leaves serve as healing. How many want that? How many want to be a tree that forever bears fruit? Forever bears fruit. That everything that comes out of you will be of healing. How many want to be fresh? How many of us are still stuck on salty? <laughs> when God's calling us to be fresh, to be made new. I like to, like I said, a bunch of Bible verses reiterate this. Verse 20, thus by the fruits you will recognize them. What fruit are you producing? Would it be any that some would be, yeah. Yeah, they're into deep end. Yeah, they're plugged into Jesus. Yeah, I see it. I see it, definitely. You know, because we all know, and I think Sylvester has said this, when they're growing, a banana and a plantain look very different. And I know that because I'm Puerto Rican. And my roommate asked me the other day, is that a banana? And I was like, no, it's a plantain. And they were like, oh, so you eat it raw? And I was like, no, don't try it. You're going to get constipation. <laughs> The truth. <laughs> and therefore, the fruit tells you what kind of tree it is. You probably get an apple tree, an orange tree, and a mango tree. Well, a mango tree would probably look different. But an apple tree and an orange tree during like non-harvest season. And you'd be looking like, wow, that's a really great tree. I wonder what it grows. But when it comes harvest season, when it's planted, when it's soiled, when it's bearing fruit all the time, that's an apple tree. That's an orange tree. 
I can tell because of the fruit, not because of the leaf, not because of the genealogy, not because of the seed, not because of anything, but because of its fruit. Jeremiah. But blessed is the one who trusts the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out roots by the stream. It does not fear when he comes. Its leaves are always green and it has no worry in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. I'm giving you Old Testament and New Testament. These are promises of what happens when you're deep in the living water, when you're right next to it. Finally, a faith that endures. And I think I've been doubting on this one the most. What do you get at the deep end? You get faith that endures. Not that little faith. Not the kind that you learn just from learning Sunday school. And I always say this. God is not interested in having grandchildren. Not interested in having brother-in-laws, sister-in-laws, nieces, nephews. No interest. Only sons and daughters. Which means the faith of your parents, the faith of others, the faith you grew up in Sunday school, that's not what God wants. That's, that's not what he's interested in. Your girl? That's not what he wants. He wants to call you son. He wants to call you daughter. And the truth is that this faith that endures, endurance only comes from testing. Endurance only comes after you work. How do you know I tried to gym with Priya this week? Still sore. Because <laughs> I don't do gyms. <laughs> and there's an endurance you have to build. You just go walk in, lift up 20 pounds, deadlift, oh, grunt, let go. On your first day, you can't. You break a lot of things. <laughs> if you did. And it's the same idea. If your faith is like my gym status, <laughs> we have a problem. <laughs> you need a faith that will endure. That means that you've worked out, you've tested, you've put on more weight, you've kept the Lord to just every day faithfully just pressing in, pressing in. And if you thought today I was going to tell you to read your Bible, pray, no. Because we know what we ought to do. We've been probably even told that most of our lives. But there is something in the deeper that God wants to connect with you. There is purpose in the deeper. You're not going to get your purpose in the shallow. And he's going to keep on pushing you towards that. That faith can't be this big. Because what God has planned for you is this big. So you need to, you need to bulk up to hold it up. If you know what I'm talking about. Because what the treasures he has for your life, what he actually wants to do with you, requires you to work out in faith. Don't, don't go to the gym and be like Mary Ellie said, we have, to, we have to stop. No, in faith. <clears throat> there comes a point, once you dive into the deep, in your relationship with God, that you will no longer feel the bottom and the waves begin to crash over, and yet you're in faith. Even though your faith is being stretched, at the same time, there's this overwhelming peace which only comes from knowing that God is doing a work in you. Finally, because I know we have exams, <laughs> and I can talk all day. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, so like I said, there's a lot of swimming stories we could probably all share, and one of my favorites is we were at this women's mommy daughter kind of thing. It's a pool party, and we had Ruby. She was about three. She was a little three-year-old in the group. And mid Bible study, little tight, jumped straight into the deep, drowning. Twenty Spanish mothers freaking out. Her mother, without jumps right after her only to remember when she hits the water that she too doesn't know how to swim so now we have two people drowning 
Thankfully, one of the boys was a lifeguard, and so he jumped right in, picked up the daughter, took out the mom, and everybody's looking at this mom for like the next hour, just like, so why did you jump out? <laughs> in our career where we're gonna ask our patients, so why? <laughs> like, have you ever been there doing CPD, those fourth and fifth termers, and they give you the clinical vignette, and you're like, why? <laughs> Good question. Like, you just escalated the problem. But that's the love of a parent, that you completely forsake your own. You completely give up your own life. You don't even care. You're gonna push her up. You're going to save her, even if you die. One thing about the reason I, I gave this sermon was because some of you guys might still be with your shallow faith. You're not really sure about Jesus. But let me tell you a little bit about him. Not only is he the living water, but he was the one who one day jumped straight into the deep end, saw you drowning in your sin without hesitation. Without hesitation, he didn't hesitate. He saw you drowning in your own sin, and he jumped right in to save you, gave his own life just so he can meet you in the deep end again. So originally, instead of diving in the deep end, I was going to say the floaties are coming off. I was saturated, but I couldn't find floaties at IJ. <laughs> There is a God who made everything you see in front of you. And he would have forsaken it all just to save you. And there was a God who gave his only son just so he can know you at a deeper level. And what I want to leave you with this morning is a challenge to jump further, jump deeper. There's never a point in our Christian walk that we are comfortable. Because nobody, nobody has reached the depth of his love yet. That's just too deep. So when you, when I see those people like, oh, you know, I'm really comfortable, I'm really great, you know, I just do this music thing, or I just do this vibe. No, deeper. You're never done swimming. You will never hit the bottom with God. It's a world waiting for you down there. A world. And one of the greatest treasures is that, if we go back to the previous verses, he says, whoever has this will have living water flowing out of them. So you jump straight into the deep end, and the deeper you go, the more people will come. Because like I said, we have thirsty campus. And they're looking for that living water. So what's the push? Get deeper with God so that people can go deeper. So that you can be a well yourself. So that when your mouth opens, there's living water coming out. For all the hopeless, for all the anxious, I'd like to remind you that because it's not just about you. Jesus gave it all to you, but it's not just about you. <laughs> and the final verse. I don't know, I'm sure not verse 3, but all of it's good. For the raging roar of, this, of the stormy winds and the crashing waves cannot erode our faith in you. God has a constant flowing river whose sparkling streams bring joy and delight. Can I have that? who brings joy and delight to his people. His river flows right through the city of God Most High into his holy dwelling place. God is in the midst of his city, secure and never shaken. So, where are my turn once again? I'm going to turn fours. This city is secure and never shaken. Tomorrow, you're secure. You're never shaken. You're, it doesn't matter how many you click for review. That doesn't matter. 
You're secure and unshaken. Why? Because He is faithful. Like Slyra says, He who began the good work in you. Will surely see it to completion. God bless you, CSA. And if you need prayer for any reason, you're freaking out for the exam tomorrow, you don't know Jesus, you want to dive in deeper, there will be people on the side that would love to pray for you. Amen. Amen to that. I as she mentioned that that God is calling us to deeper. Um, and in many ways, sometimes we for, we might forget when we're in our situations, when we're living our daily lives, we might forget um, why God is still reaching out his hand towards us. So why this living water is important to to fill us up so that we can reach out and fill other people up. But I hope um, that what we can remember is the cross what Jesus did on the cross. And that's what communion is about today. Um, today is the first Sunday of November. Um, we normally have communion and um, I just want to agree with Mary Lee as we're going in deeper and by God's grace, you know, we're leaving the shallow waters for the deep end. When there's doubts, when there's a feeling of fear, you know, do I do I go in deeper, or do I go back to where it's more comfortable? I hope that we can remember what Jesus did on the cross for us. Um, so I'm going to read from First Corinthians eleven, verses twenty three to through twenty six. Um, it's about the communion. I have my water here and I have a biscuit. So I guess I'll just give everyone a moment to prepare. Father, I just want to thank you for today. I want to thank you, Lord God, for this time. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for inhabiting our praise. Thank you for being in our midst. Holy Spirit, as you look forward ahead towards the week heavenly father i just pray for your grace i pray for your peace i pray most especially that your presence goes ahead of us this week your presence stays with us as we encounter each day heavenly father i thank you that your mercies are new every morning and every night as we wake up in the morning we can recount your faithfulness through the night i pray especially for joy i pray for for all those studying for exams, I pray for those that are in the workplace as they're going into a new week. I pray for all those that are at home, taking care of family members, taking care of themselves. Heavenly Father, I pray that this week will be an exceptional week in Jesus' name. That as they walk through each day, that there will be thanksgiving in their heart and thanksgiving and blessing every single day. I pray that they find favor with you and they find favor with those around them in Jesus' name. Every information, every everything that they need to um, this week, resources, Lord God, strength, might, comfort, confidence, encouragement. I pray all these on them for the rest of this week. And I pray, Lord God, that even as they go about the rest of their day, for some the rest of their night, I pray, Lord God, that it is well with them, it is well with their families, it is well with whatever they set out their hands to accomplish. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Bye, CSA. <laughs> Thank you guys for coming out. If you guys still want to stay ahead or reach out to anyone personally, 
go ahead. I'll be here till for the next five minutes. <laughs> but otherwise, have a wonderful night and thank you for coming. I hope to see you guys throughout the week in all our other CSA events, Bible studies, etc. Um, and yeah, bye bye.